Good, good morning. Welcome to the latest in our Stevenson Harwood webinar super yacht series. My, my name is Sean Gibbons and I'm a partner in the marine and international trade team in our office in London. Among other things, I have a particular interest and specialism in, in super yachts, both in negotiation and drafting of contracts, and also when things go wrong, as they sometimes do, unfortunately, in the resolution of disputes. In previous webinars that we've presented, we've looked at what the overall super yacht market looks like post COVID, including current trends and design features, the impact of the pandemic on contractual arrangements and the onboard yacht experience after COVID. And we also look, we've also looked at construction and refit contracts. Since the most recent webinar that we presented in July, and I did listen the other day to that, that webinar, and interestingly, my colleague Max, who was presenting that, made a a prediction which was slightly wrong because it was the same week as the European Championship final and he predicted it, uh, England to win on penalties and of course um, Italy won on penalties but never mind we do we sometimes get things wrong um, but of course since 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 that period in July we've had a slew of yacht shows um, including Cannes and, and Monaco um, and it's very clear that certainly business is booming in, in the super yacht market um, certainly in Europe so what what we thought we'd do today and what we'd like to do is in this webinar focus on the Asia Pacific region and discuss market trends and opportunities in the region and we'd also like to explore how private wealth management uh, advisors, lawyers and commercial advisors will uh, support super yacht owners in their projects. And we're very pleased to have today on board as members of our panel representatives of, of very different sectors in the market from brokers, luxury yacht service providers through financiers, luxury concierge arrangers, and also last but not least, lawyers. Uh, and specifically, I'm very pleased to welcome Adam Blackmore of Fraser Yachts, uh, who is Fraser Yachts in Hong Kong, although Adam is, is just at the moment in the UK. Um, Louis Jerome Monnier from BNP Paribas Wealth Management in Hong Kong. Um, also from Hong Kong, my fellow partner Kevin Lee. And I should just mention that, that there is a uh, typhoon warning in Hong Kong today. So they are, they are at fact both at home. Um, so I should mention that. And also Vincent Lam from Flag in the Sand at Lifestyle Limited in Singapore. So first, I'd like to introduce Adam Blackmore. Adam is originally from the UK, but works now for Fraser in Hong Kong and has lived and worked in Asia since 2013, specializing in, in the luxury yacht market. Fraser are the largest luxury yacht service provider in the world with over 170 employees and 16 offices worldwide, covering among various things, the chartering of yachts, purchase of yachts, new bills and the management of super yachts. And Adam has many years experience helping clients to buy and sell super yachts and the special expertise in the construction of new build super yachts. So Adam, welcome. Many thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, as, as I mentioned there, we, we've seen most recently from the Monaco Yacht Show a boom in the super yacht market in Europe. But it, what I would first maybe ask you, is it the same in the Asia Pacific region? And if that's the case, what, what in your view is driving that market? In the Asia Pacific yeah, region, things are definitely moment. booming in in Asia. You know, in Asia Pacific, obviously, I'm based predominantly in Hong Kong, and given the the recent travel restrictions in the last few years, um, my focus has definitely been forced to be the the local market. But um, given the influx of new buyers and people that have been thinking about buying yachts for many years and that have finally pulled the pin, um, it's certainly been a very busy time for for everybody. Um, you, you touched on the boat shows, and I was actually I, I made the decision to to commit and to do Can and Monaco yacht show, and then also I had a transaction going on in Europe at the same time, so the timing was perfect. Um, but the boat shows, I think it's so important for brokers to attend and for, for marine professionals to attend the yacht shows. So when you come then back. To, to your 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 the, the area which you sell the boats in, you have the latest information and you you're up to date. Because from in the last two years, since we haven't been doing boat shows, things have changed so much. The boats are different, the industry is different, the the designs are just out of this world. They're amazing. Um, so I'm quite excited to come back and to meet meet new clients and to 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 be able to explain that firsthand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of them driving the market, to answer your question. Um, first time buyers, I would say, is is one of the key things. And 
typically, I mean, I've been selling yachts nearly 15 years. Typically, first-time buyers might dip their toe in the water and buy, say, a 60-footer or, or even a 50-footer or a 40-foot boat. But they seem to be coming straight in at 80 or 90 or even larger. Um, I'm just going, you know, missing two or three steps and going straight to that super yacht. And, and are, are you seeing that sort of that, that size of vessel being bought in, in the Asia Pacific market as, as well? Or is it, are they slightly smaller boats that people are looking for out there? Um, we, I mean, in Hong Kong, we run a very diverse business. So we have um, a company which specializes in selling smaller boats with a dealership. For, we have a, a brands for several different dealerships. So yeah. kind of get a scope of the entire market. And we are also selling those in, in decent numbers. Um, supply is is such a, a difficulty, uh, not necessarily the manufacturers being able to build them, but in terms of them resource, uh, getting parts and getting um, the, the, all the things they need to construct the boat. So the supply chain has definitely been affecting things, I would say. Um, but the will is there and the interest is there. Um, but I would say, yeah, the influx from what, what I can see is 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 being brought by, by first-time buyers. Um, uh, which, you know, if, if they go down the route of, in, of using a lawyer and using a professional broker, those transactions that kind of have actually been very simple. Yeah. Some of the deals I've done in the last couple of years have been with first-time owners. When they put their trust in the broker and they put their trust in the professionals, it's, um, it's actually relatively a simple transaction. Um, and the supply chain has been impacted because of COVID? And has that, has COVID You've seen a change in the market, or has that driven the market in many ways? Both. Both. It's caused an issue because all of a sudden people's production has gone, uh, you know, up by 20, 30, or 40, or 50 percent. Their their order book has grown, and the people that you know, the people that are making the air conditioning systems, or I know Volvo Penta particularly for the D2, D3, D4 engines, their smaller horsepower engines, have had massive problems with their, the, the company that make their engine blocks, for example, I had a, from the boat shows, again, I've got all this information yep. first, and, yep. and uh, Volvo Penta are now looking to actually build their own engine blocks rather than, rather than rely on a supplier because it was the supplier that was causing the issues. Um, okay. Things are very difficult to explain to a first time buyer um, because in their mind, a yacht is built like an Audi or a BMW where you have robots, you know, but of course we know that it's done, it's very hands-on and it's very, uh, it's very um, human orientated rather than robotics. Because I, I was going to ask in my, my experience of, of dealing with, I'm not typecasting, but in, in my experience of dealing with people, clients in the Asian market, they're not necessarily known for their patience. Um, and obviously money doesn't sleep, that sort of um, view. Is that, that's, are there, is that a sort of common characteristic in terms of people are, wanting things happening yesterday rather than wait, being prepared to wait. Are you seeing that? I think where I'm able to deal direct with the buyer, it's, it's a lot easier because they can see that we're genuine and they can see our interest is to protect them and to look after them. When you have sometimes a friend of a friend or introducer or somebody that is a boat expert, then the, the message can be diluted and then it becomes, um, becomes challenging. Having said that, I've also done some really great deals where the, the deal has not come directly. It has been introduced by a friend. So I don't know. I take each, each deal as it is. I try and learn from each transaction and try and learn from each customer. Um, but yeah, sometimes people are very impatient for sure. And perhaps don't look at the overall picture and just look at uh, just look at one one thing. Okay. That's not not, not the, the, the main case. I find that's one in ten, maybe. Okay, and are you dealing, are you in the Asia Pacific region, are you finding yourself dealing more with family offices and intermediaries then rather than the individuals? Because obviously we know that certain buyers in the Middle East, for instance, they tend to use family offices, don't they? And, and things on, how, how does uh, it work? Yes and no. So again, you, you're dealing often with the, the, the owner will have a fixer, the owner will have somebody who works for them and is, you know, on the, on the payroll that organizes their cars, perhaps, that organizes their staff at home, that organizes their luxury items. And again, this can be very hit or miss. It depends on that person's attitude, how well the deal will go, or even if a deal will happen. I've had instances where that individual has actually stopped the transaction from happening and stopped their boss from buying the boat they wanted. Sounds bizarre, but that can be the case. 
in other cases, they've been amazing and they've been key and so integral to the deal. So um, it, it's all about the personality of the individual and, and how much responsibility the owner puts on that person, I guess. Yeah. And, and what, what sort of limitations do you, do you see in, in the Asia Pacific region in terms of infrastructure, possibly, or just general limitations that may affect the growth of the super yacht market in the Asia Pacific region? Um, I think the just talking about Hong Kong and a few recent experiences, I won't go into obviously too much detail for no. um, but I think the, 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 the captains are becoming older and right. the are becoming significantly more uh, technical and you know there is nothing mechanical on the boat anymore. Everything is plug in, everything is you know log into a system and then you're connected with the manufacturer in Europe or wherever it may be. Um, and the captains simply are not used to this and they've never been trained in this environment. You know, they, where they were doing their learning during their learning period in their teens and 20s and 30s, everything was mechanical. You know, you had um, old style Caterpillar engines or um, and the MTU Mercedes engines from a long, long time ago. And this is where these people learn in the industry. And there are no, um, certainly in Hong Kong and where I've done a lot of business in Thailand and places like that, there's no or little infrastructure to retrain these people and the owners don't necessarily understand the importance of training and having their crews up to date with the latest technology, even when they buy a brand new boat. So I've certainly had a lot of cases where there's been failures on board, but actually it's just a case of resetting the system or it's a case of, yeah. you know, going into the back end of the, the monitoring system and, and turning an alarm off, for example, or the captain just rings up and says the boat's broken. Yeah. But that's not necessarily his fault. It's not his fault. You know, no. he needs you know, to say, it's important you understand these things. So therefore, go to the Seakeeper training course for the gyro or go have a day with the NTU engineer to understand how their systems work. So I think it needs to come from both ends, from the willingness of the crew to learn and also from the owners understanding the importance. But that, I think, is a, has been a big challenge for us, definitely. Um, having very simple failures ruin the day of the owner where it necessarily wouldn't have ne been, been the case uh, before. And in terms of infrastructure and, and the existence of new or old marinas and things and spaces to birthing, birthing slots and things, What's the position? I think you mentioned to me that there, there is a relatively new, the, the Lantau uh, Marina. I was reading about, talking about typhoons, that there are typhoons, there's a typhoon shelter that may be converted possibly into a marina in Hong Kong. It, are things changing and improving that, in, that, in that respect? But, but I think it's a funny one. Whenever, you, whenever I had a meeting with a yacht owner and their friend, or they've been talking to their friends about buying boats, the, the first thing they say is you can never find a boat. It's impossible. There's no birthing. If you want, you know, birth A1 in the Aberdeen Marina Club, yeah. which is full for 20 years and the waiting list is 20 years, of course, right. you're not going to get a birth. But if you're a little flexible and, and to be honest, for the Hong Kong, how people do boating here, it allows a lot of flexibility because there are 20 or 30 government uh, pontoons or pickup areas where you can get collected. So there might be one just down the road from your office and you don't know it. So yeah. on a Friday afternoon, the yacht can come from the marina, which might not be super close to your home or super close to your office, but then it can pick you and your family up from a convenient location. A lot of people in Hong Kong don't know this. Um, right. I spend a lot of time with owners describing how boats are properly used here. There's the right way to do it and there's, there's the wrong way to do it. And we spend a lot of time in saying, well, where's your office? You know, well, where, where do you live? Well, actually, you don't need to come to the AMC because the boat can pick you up from here. It's far more convenient. So I think spending time describing to owners how boats should be used and how they really are used allows for more flexibility with the berthing. Um, okay. If you live on the south side, they have it in their mind, the boat has to be on the south side. Right. But necessarily, they might not want to get picked up there because their office isn't central or they want to go to the country club first and then get picked up, whatever. So as, as long as the owner is a little bit flexible with the, the location of the berthing, honestly, it's not too much of an issue, primarily because of Lantau, this new yacht club. Um, yeah. I have several yachts in there now with owners, and we've sold quite a few berths. Um, the team is great there. They're really supportive. The berths are really nice. It's a proper super yacht marina. 
uh, with 400 volt door power and super, right. wide, super wide pontoons that you can get a golf buggy up and down and turn it around. It's a little remote if you come by road, perhaps. Uh, and because there's strict rules within the Lantau area of flex for cars, um, in short, if you're flexible, it's not a problem. No. Okay, thank you. And, and, and can I just ask a couple more questions just about cryptocurrencies? Do you see that them being used in, in deals or? Um, not so much. I've had quite a few people contact me recently wanting to buy in cryptocurrency or, or their intention. Uh, yeah, the, most people that, that, that I've been contacted recently who are talking about cryptocurrency have not been genuine, should we say? No. Okay. One, I entertained it, you know, entertained it for a bit, and then <laughs> got to a point, and I'm thinking, oh, these guys, you know, I've done this long enough. I've sold nearly 300 yachts. You know, I I understand where things are yeah. genuine, and as soon as you ask for their KYC, they go very quiet. So yes. <laughs> Actually, to that, I have a client who sold a boat to recently. His first boat was a 50 footer. It was a million euros. And he, he, he has his wealth and his business is a very, very reputable crypto company business. Um, and he's looking for, to upgrade in the near future. So, but I have face to face with him. You know, I can go and physically see him yeah, exactly. yeah. in, in the ether somewhere. And, and maybe finally, could I just ask you about uh, the new build mar market? I, I, I personally have, had a chat. I visited a, a yard in China a few years, maybe three years ago, where there was a, a, a super yacht being built. It was there were issues around delay and and fit out. Um, and ultimately, I'm I'm not sure that that particular yard has continued at the moment. Anyway, building super yachts is is, is do you see a, a, any growth in in new buildings in in, in the Asia Pacific region, particularly in China, or is that something that's just not happening? Um, I think it is happening. There, there's a 44 meter or 46 meter yacht that turned up to Hong Kong a few months ago. I have no idea what it was. Right. I'm pretty fanatical. My friends will send me a photo of, you know, a tiny little section of a boat, and I can tell them what it was and when it was built. Yeah. I have photographic memory for stuff like that, and I had literally no idea what it was. And I was driving around it on a tender, thinking, "What is this thing?" Yes. I was later contacted actually by the representative of the owner asking for some help with your management. And I then put two and two together and they told me the manufacturer of the boat. I'd never heard of them before. And right. they're serious boats. They're building very large catamarans. They're building very large motor yachts. They don't really build small boats. They're just focusing on big stuff. Um, I'm yet to go on board, so it's difficult for me to comment on the quality or the fit out or whatever. But from the outside, it looks very impressive. It's that, you know, flat on the water, it looked good. Um, so for big boats, I think it's there, but I think we necessarily don't, don't know about it. Right. Even, okay. even a yacht broker based in Hong Kong. Um, there also are companies that, uh, like Pearl Motor Yachts, for example, I know them very well. The, the founder of that is a good friend of mine. They have their production in Zhuhai in China, where they uh, put most of the boat together. And then they ship the boat to the UK for final fit out for all the very small detail stuff. All right. And they they had a very successful can yacht show. Um, so yeah, their production is is going up. Okay. Um, and then of course it is in Taiwan, um, yeah. which have been very long standing and have most of their market traction is in the US and continues to grow. Um, in mainland China, I'll be honest, I don't do much business there myself. Um, we are very focused in, you know, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Hong Kong, Indonesia, those kind of areas. So we don't dip in too much into China. No. So, so maybe the final question, if you have to ask about, obviously, there's a difference, as you know, between Hong Kong, people, the market in Hong Kong and the market in mainland China. Do, do you ex expect mainland China to open up further? Or are there issues such, you know, there's outward displays of wealth that may be frowned upon and that sort of thing? Do, do, you, do you see that market opening up in the next few years in, in mainland China? I think um, it's funny. So I, I, yeah, I, as you know, I was one of the few brokers to make the trip and undergo the arduous quarantine measures when yes. I leave Hong Kong. <laughs> I've been in Europe now for a couple of months. I fly on Thursday, and I've got 21 days in a hotel room. Which, yeah. See how that goes. Anyway, when I was in Europe, uh, in Monaco and Cannes and whatever else, I've been to Italy, various different places. Uh, there do seem to be quite a few Chinese people who have now moved to, to Europe. Right. Didn't talk to them. I saw them in restaurants. I saw them in passing. I saw them maybe at a, you know during the boat show. But it seems like 
they've been in Europe for some time and are now relocating there. So I can't see personally what's going on with the regime and uh, the, the kind of battle with wealth in China. Um, I can't see the market growing there personally. It's not something that I'm going to be myself focused on. Right. But who knows? For, for, yeah. Yeah, but for the business in mainland China, I'm uh, maybe Vincent knows better than me. So yeah. he, later can, on, he can, can answer on that. Detail. Well, th th Adam, thank you very much indeed for, for, for those um, comments. Uh, that's much appreciated. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You're brilliant. Uh, if, if we could now, I'd like, I'd like to introduce someone from the, the banking side. So Louis Jérôme Monnier of BNP Paribas Wealth Management in, in Hong Kong. Louis Jérôme is an executive director in the, the JET and Yacht Finance Asia Pacific team at BNP Paribas and responsible for the financing of business jets and super yachts for ultra and high net worth clients in the region. He's been with the bank for about 13 years, initially in Geneva, but relocated to Hong Kong a few years ago, and therefore has great knowledge and insight into the super yacht market and private wealth market uh, in, in, the, in the Asia Pacific region. So Louis Jerome, welcome. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much um, for meeting me. That, that's okay. Um, just maybe a similar question to start with Adam there. You, you're, what in your, or the bank's view, is, is driving the market for super yacht ownership in the Asia Pacific region? And how big is that market? And do you see an increase in demand for financing in, in, in your and the bank's experience? Um, first of all, I think on the, on the private banking side, uh, what we, we need to keep in mind is that. Uh, the, the wealth management uh, growth today is driven by the Asian market and more specifically by China. Uh, the number of billionaires uh, doubled over the last five years from uh, 500 billionaires to 1,000. Nowadays, there are more billionaires in China, mainland, than in the US. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what the, the, the growth growth that we have in China in terms of number of billionaires is 10 times bigger than the growth of billionaires in the US. Uh, they, right. This is, I would say, something very, very big that is happening. There is lots of creation of wealth, and they, what is true for the billionaires, it's also true uh, for the ultra high net worth individual. That's the first thing that is very important for us, and uh, this is the reason why the bank has been, I would say, uh, present uh, for many years uh, in Hong Kong uh, since 1958, uh, and also uh, for many years in the jet uh, and yacht financing. We, we did, I think, our first jet financing in 2000. Eight, if I'm correct, and the first yacht uh, that we finance uh, in Hong Kong was in 2013. So, I mean, we, we have been present in the market uh, since many years because we, we know that uh, there is a big market. For the time being, I have to admit that so far the, 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 the market is, is a bit more dynamic on the jet side than on the yacht side. It's still, I would say, um, uh, if we compare the, 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 the number of billionaires compared to uh, the, the, the number of yacht owners, um, I would say the, 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 the Asia Pacific market is still um, underrepresented compared to uh, Europe and US. Basically, today you have maybe 35% uh, of the owners that are based uh, in Europe, 35% in the US, uh, and then you maybe have. Uh, 10% in the Middle East or a bit more, and, and, and maybe something similar in Asia Pacific, but it's, it's, uh, it does not represent the number of uh, very wealthy people that we have. Um, so, I mean, for us, it, it, it has always been a, a market that, uh, on, on which we had a close look um, because we, we, we think the, the market will grow. Um, but there, there, there are some, some hurdles to tackle, and uh, there, there are also some, some uh, I would say, uh, local uh, short-term also uh, events uh, to, to consider. Uh, in terms of drivers, I would say um, the, the, the economy is an important driver. When the economy is here, when uh, the growth is here, uh, you can expect that uh, there is more purchase. Uh, we have uh, noticed over this uh, period of COVID, lots of uh, purchase in Hong Kong, for instance, because uh, we had the, 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 this problem of, of traveling uh, outside Hong Kong. Um, in China, at the same time, especially since the, be at the beginning of the summer, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit more challenging because of the, of the politics, because of the, of the uh, worry of, uh, I would say, the, the display of wealth, where uh, we have uh, clients who are uh, a bit more cautious. Um, after, compared to, to, to Adam, I think we, we are not 
I mean, we, we are not exactly in the whole market described by Adam in the sense that uh, as a banker, uh, we generally do not finance yachts below 10 million euro, uh, which means that we are mostly focused on yachts uh, above 30 meters and even uh, 40 meters. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a very tiny market. The, the main market is probably in Hong Kong. Today in Hong Kong, uh, for 30 meters yacht or plus, we have maybe a 90, 95 berth, which is, uh, I would say, small. Uh, then the second market is probably uh, in Thailand and in Singapore. Um, but it's, it's, it's not yet a very big market, I would say. Um, but that's, that, that's where is the market. What I observe, I mean, Adam was mentioning first-time buyers. At, at my level, I don't uh, see lots of first-time buyers. I see mostly uh, people who are uh, buying bigger yachts. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, we have several examples today of people who uh, had uh, like a 40 meters yacht and, and goes really uh, to something really, really bigger. It does not necessarily mean that the boat will be in Asia Pacific. Uh, ah. They may be Asian, but they may uh, keep the yacht uh, in the Mediterranean Sea uh, or maybe it's to travel uh, all around the world, but not necessarily in, uh, in Asia. Um, and the, the, the other, I would say, uh, burden that I understand is that um, here the, the, the need is still remain a, a local need in the sense that yeah. if you have a, a yacht in Hong Kong, there are many possibilities in Hong Kong. There are like 250 islands. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a very nice area for a day trip. But then if you want to move outside Hong Kong, where do you go? Uh, the, the next stop is, is not really close because uh, I would say you have mainland China, but mainland China it could uh, represent some constraints, some administrative constraints to sail in mainland China. Uh, then you can go to the Philippines, but it's already a bit far for uh, huh. a small yacht. Um, and, and then you have the Southeast Asia where you have lots of possibilities like uh, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines. Uh, um, and, and, in, in, and, and you can go stop in Singapore, um, but that's, I would say where we are today. And in, term, in terms of the characteristics, if I can put it that way, of the buyers that you, you see in the Asian Pacific region and, and, and the bank's appetite for risk, uh, is, there, is there any different approach in the bank's credit risk assessment when looking at transactions involving Asia Pacific based borrowers rather than say borrowers in other parts of the world, uh, is, is there any difference in you know, that that sort of issue? Mm. That, that, that's a that's a very interesting question. Uh, indeed, I mean it's a, it's a younger market uh, with less infrastructures, with uh, less I would say trained people in the industry, uh, smaller yacht manager. For, for us, the, the yacht manager is really a key partner in the, in, in the transaction. Yes, we, we need to ensure that uh, we have a yacht manager that uh, maintains properly the boat, that is able to crew properly uh, the boat. Uh, and uh, Adam mentioned that uh, also that uh, finding uh, captains could be difficult. Uh, we, we, we noticed that uh, under the current uh, environment uh, with the travel restrictions in Singapore or in Hong Kong, it could even be uh, more difficult. Um, but for us, it's, it's I would say, uh, what we try to, 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 to explain to our clients and to push our clients is that if they want to preserve the value of their assets, of their yacht, uh, they should maintain it properly. Um, and we are in an environment where uh, there are many risks. For instance, today uh, we have a typhoon risk. Uh, you expect yeah. that the, the, the yacht <laughs> properly birth. Uh, with all the required, I would say, safety to, to avoid any problem. We had six months ago uh, fire in the Aberdeen Marina where uh, 40 boats uh, burnt. Right. I think it's in the mind of all the people uh, in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and it's also, I would say, a, a topic that is uh, cl um, closely monitored by the, by the insurers. Uh, with some, what we have observed, some premium that are uh, increasing uh, uh, years after years. Uh, okay, uh, and do you, again, I asked Adam about this, that the, do you expect mainland China to open up further in this market? So are you seeing much business, new business coming from there in particular? 
Um, that, that, that's that's a, uh, a tricky a tricky question. Um, I, I would say we 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 expect mainland China to 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 open up uh, for several years now. Uh, we have seen that they have made some significant investment, for instance, in in Hainan. Um, we have seen uh, several uh, people uh, with a willingness to I would say to to develop their own uh, brand, own shipyards to build their their, their own yachts. I would say uh, we, we we feel the intention. We have also noticed that uh, some real estate developers were interested in building uh, marinas because uh, then they can uh, build some some you know some some real estate properties that are more valuable because it's next to the marina. So I would say the intention is here. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the growth of uh, wealthy people I think will drive that. I think uh, there, there is a. A growing need in uh, mainland China uh, for uh, local tourism, yeah. um, but on the short term, I would say uh, it's not the priority of the government. The priority of the government is to have a growth that benefits to uh, the, 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 the whole uh, people of China and not uh, uh, a, a smaller share of them. Um, so this is why I would say um, it's, it's not in their top priority. In the meantime, uh, we remain very confident that uh, the market uh, will grow. Uh, I just think that it will grow uh, cautiously to, 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 to remain, I would say, uh, acceptable. Okay, thank you. Maybe just two further questions. Sorry, I meant to ask you when I was asking about the credit uh, risk assessment. Uh, in, in terms of security packages that you expect to, to see from borrowers in the Asia Pacific region, I, I'm guessing that that's no different to how you would expect anywhere else in the world in terms of what the bank wants to see as security, or are there any particular um, nuances uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region that, that you see? Um, so, I mean, it, it, the, the, it, it, I mean, you, you, you know quite well how we do our asset finance. Um, yes. I would say there, there are some key aspects for us. Uh, often the, the, one of the key aspects is the incorporation of the SPV. Uh, it's the flag of the boat. Um, what we see here on, on the really large yachts, it's not very different to what we have observed so far in Europe. Yeah. Um, most of the time, those large yachts spend also uh, uh, some time in Europe, so this is probably the reason why it's uh, very similar in many ways. What we observe on, on smaller yachts is that for practicalities, I mean, for, for some local reasons, for instance, in Hong Kong, it could make sense to have a Hong Kong flag. Uh, and in that case, the, 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 the yacht will probably have a Hong Kong uh, SPV. I would say it, it's, it's not very different. Um, on the credit point of view, uh, we, we, for us, we, we, we always look at what is the private banking relationship that we are able to develop with these clients. And uh, what is sure is that, um, I mean, as a private bank, uh, we are keen to offer this kind of uh, yacht financing. Uh, if uh, we see uh, some um, good, uh, how to say, uh, opportunities to develop our, our, our private banking. Uh, yeah, interest. that drives, that drives the, uh, okay. okay. And, and maybe just, just a final question. We discussed mainland China there. And you've mentioned other destinations um, in, in the Asia Pacific region. Which jurisdictions are, are you seeing the most growth in, the, in, in terms of either owners or chartering destinations in, in the Asia Pacific region? Um, I, I would say Singapore, uh, Singapore, and also Thailand. Um, I think it's, right. it's, it's, it's two markets uh, that are dynamic. Um, we, we, we have some. I mean, we, we, we have made some deals there. And, and, and we, 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 we have some opportunities. Um, I, I think there are some, some I mean, interesting markets. Uh, yeah, that, that's basically what, what, what I was saying. And, and, and so maybe Australia, New Zealand, that sort of, are you, are you seeing much coming from there? Or? It, it actually, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I would say it's not a part uh, that, that, that I cover, so I, right. I don't know the market. Uh, I've seen uh, in the past uh, some, uh, I would say, uh, Australian individuals uh, willing to purchase some very significant shorts. I, I know that it's a dynamic market, but it's not a market that I know. No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Louis Jean. That's very, very uh, interesting comments. Um, and thank you very much for your time, time uh, this, this morning, this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Okay.
And I, I'd now like to move um, to introduce my colleague in, in the Stevenson Harwood Hong Kong office, uh, Kevin Lee. Kevin leads our private wealth practice in Asia. Uh, what I would like to discuss with Kevin are the ways in which law firms and Stevenson Harwood, of course, can assist the owners and operators of such high value assets uh, as super yachts uh, to structure the ownership and use of those assets in, in uh, an appropriate and cost effective way. Um, so Kevin, well, welcome this, this afternoon. Um, Thanks, Sean. So, so for those of us who are less familiar, Kevin, with private wealth legal practice, uh, aside from generally advising high net worth individuals, what does your practice actually actually focus on? Um, so thanks, Sean. Uh, yeah, so in, in a way, we are the advisors to the family or founders sometimes of, of major companies, and, and that is a very broad role. Um, so I think Adam mentioned that the term uh, a fix-it person, a fixer. Well, in, in some ways, we're the consigliere, we're the fixer, it, whatever the needs are. If we're not experts ourselves, we bring in colleagues or even external you know, outsourced help um, as needed. But it, it, in some ways, these clients trust us to find the solutions. And these would be the legal solutions. Um, so what we do not do is the wealth management in the sense of uh, investment advice, right? We're, we're the legal side, um, and that can run the whole gamut from uh, something as simple as wills and dealing with estates to succession planning, to uh, setting up trusts or corporate or other vehicles for, for the right purpose, to philanthropy. And uh, lately I've introduced ESG into our our, our uh, platform of services by bringing in an expert in that area as well. Right. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, that's obviously a, a broad practice. And, and to bring things back to the issues address, being addressed today, how, how might you and we be able to assist clients or intermediaries, of course, when it comes to owning or dealing with the, or the operation of super yachts? Yeah, that's, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we, we've long noticed that some of these uh, significant assets that the ultra high net worth clients are interested in, such as super yachts or private jets or even fine art, um, are a natural fit for the private wealth practice. So the concerns that our clients have uh, outside of these areas, so let's say their wealth generally, uh, we advise them on how to structure wealth, how to plan for the next generation how to guard that wealth in legal legal structures such as trusts, um, or it could be other vehicles, uh, so that the wealth is not suddenly lost on, say, uh, a child getting divorced um, after a short marriage, right? Um, uh, these sorts of concerns should be translatable to, to uh, unusual assets as well. So if we're concerned about uh, how to protect a property, let's say, well, th these yachts, these super yachts are, are worth a lot. And um, I, I'm sure the clients are as interested to, to deal with this as well. Who will get the super yacht um, if, if he passes on? Uh, I, I've thought about issues such as, you know, if you have a property and the client says, I'm going to share this, give this to three of my children equally. Um, I've actually seen how that sort of arrangement can end up in, in family disputes because mm. if one child ends up living in there with their his or her family um, and kids, how do the others ever get to benefit from this house? Now you could translate that sort of issue maybe over to a super yacht and, and really some thought must be given to that. Um, you know, how do you plan for this? Yeah. Uh, so I think it, it is, it's relatable. And, and, and how, how, in brief terms, how might our clients consider structuring the ownership of assets such as the yachts and potentially where? Uh, you right. It's a very broad question, obviously, but uh, maybe just a little, a few comments just there, Kevin. So the audience has heard mention of SPVs and things like that um, on, on this talk already. Um, I mean, if you could own a yacht in your own name, but if, if the client has any concerns, um, then what we start with is what are those concerns uh, do you, and what is the objective? What were the planned activities? Will there be financing? Uh, will there, are there tax issues we need to worry about, um, which could be driven either by tax residency or even corporate tax concerns? So if you had a simple limited liability company, 
that could be a ring fencing mechanism to protect against uh, commercial claims. You know, we must you know, be careful. You know, we, we don't uh, advise clients how to hide wealth away illegally, of course. Uh, but there could be legitimate purposes for structuring to minimize exposure to personal guarantees given on, on, on you know, loans and the like. Um, you may not want that super yacht in your own name if you're exposed that way. Or the divorce scenario I had mentioned, right? But if you use limited Com limited liability company, there, there could be potentially uh, disadvantageous tax consequences. If, if you had a structure where your super yacht was a tax loss, let's say, well, by ring fencing against claims, uh, you would not be able to apply those losses to gains somewhere else in the empire, right? So, so it's not a one size fits all solution. And then, and then the financing, if it's too complicated a structure, someone like Louis Jerome may, may say, well, this is not going to be lend itself to an easy approval on, on, on the financing side. So we've got to be careful about unnecessary complexity as well. Um, and then tax, tax residency, uh, there are jurisdictions which will look at structures that in a flow through way, is that good or bad? Is, is the structure going to earn income? Do we care, right? Uh, but in some cases, I, I guess we would look at hybrids where if you wanted the limited liability concept, uh, you could consider what the U.S. does, which is an LLC, which is a hybrid, which has looked through, passed through tax treatment, if, if that's desirable, but it, it does have limited liability. So th that's just some of the, and, and one final point about ESG, I, I suppose uh, we advise on ESG, but that might sound a bit count, you know, uh, contradictory to the super yacht market, which um, it, it may not be the most green in the world, but I believe this is a, a changing area. And some of our clients, the next generation of the um, ultra high net worths are buying into the concept. And I, I think this could drive a bit of a movement, even in areas such as uh, private jets or yachts, where you, you're seeing more of a movement towards green, sustainable, uh, either uh, batteries or power drives or, or even marinas that are built uh, in, in a more sustainable way. So I think it's an interesting yeah. uh, area to, to watch. Just so there's a question just come up on, on the screen, Kevin, about uh, ownership of a yacht under a trust by a BVI company and relevant tax considerations, etc. Obviously, that's quite a specific question, but are there some general answers that you might be able to just posit there just as a reference to a BVI yeah. company in particular? Well, we, we, our <laughs> clients still use a lot of BVI companies, and, yeah. and one of the advantages used to be uh, lack of, you know, not so much annual compliance pain, I suppose, or cost, uh, but if anyone's using that in a way that thinks they think it's a lot, a lot less transparent, I mean, the world's gone quite the opposite way right now. And, and even BVI is starting to introduce registers of directors and UBO registers. So, so, so be, be careful about why you're using that, but if it's for the right reason, for example, you can transfer the shares of a BVI company without stamp duty. These are still legitimate planning reasons and people should not shy away from uh, using offshore vehicles if it makes sense. Yeah, okay. Uh, and maybe just, just thank you for that, Kevin. I'll put you on the spot there. So, um, <laughs> There, um, obviously, there are some issues that have been in the public eye very recently, such as proposed global minimum tax rate and potential impact of economic substance requirements. But pro probably most interesting for present newsworthy reasons is the Pandora Papers. Um, are you able to just say a little bit of the impact of that disclosure as, as you see it? Um, obviously, it isn't, you, there's a lot more to come, but I just wondered if you could just uh, give us some few remarks just on that. That, that issue. Yeah, yeah, I could see that one coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I would say, um, you know, th there is a, a lens focused on the offshore world. So, and the and the super rich. Um, so if if one is structuring for a super yacht or a private jet, uh, be prepared that if this is disclosed, that there's it's innocuous, right? I mean, there's no crime and being rich. Um, so so I, I 
think what is, this is showing us is that any structure could be pierced, uh, whether that's in a legal or illegal way is a different topic. Um, and, and we we are, as professionals, we are careful what to say in public about that sort of thing. That yeah. There is the, the court of public opinion too. Yeah. But I think everyone who's interested in this market is aligned on the fact that, well, our clients are rich. They want these 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 assets and and we find a way to let them hold it in in a way that's uh that can bear scrutiny if if that were to happen right yeah. um but in terms of things like economic substance or now we're going to get a a potential uh global minimum tax the that most of the countries around the world have agreed to to implement um what does that leave where does that leave offshore well if there is a leveling of the playing field you might well find uh, jurisdictions like Singapore or Hong Kong uh, benefiting in some way in terms of uh, corporate vehicles, for example, um, or other structures, funds. Um, and, and, and if that were the case, uh, again, you look to where is, where is the client uh, doing the, the transaction and what Louis Jérôme mentioned too was the, the flag and the registration of the vessel uh, so if it's Hong Kong, for example, Hong Kong registered super yacht, we, we would use a Hong Kong company and that that's almost, you know, it's required, but there would maybe other reasons where you could tell the client, but in fact, that that's going to be less in the limelight, uh, in, you know, in terms of these sorts of exposures yeah. or yeah, yeah. curiosities of the, of the media. Okay. All right. Well, Kevin, that, that was a very brief summary of, what, of the sort of work you do, but thank you, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you, thank you for your comments. You're welcome. So, so finally, I would like, obviously, not least, I would like to introduce uh, Vincent, Vincent Lam, who is an executive director of the Singapore office of Flag in the Sand Limited, who are a luxury lifestyle management and concierge company who assist clients in access, accessing exclusive money can't buy events, and experiences, the making of luxury travel plans, and of course the sourcing and purchase of high value assets such as jets and super yachts. Uh, they have offices in London and Hong Kong, but as I've said, Vincent is, is based in their Singapore, Singapore office. Um, so well, welcome Vincent, thank you for your time this morning. I do like your backdrop there, which I understand is a sort of typical arrangement for a, a, a Chinese, uh, own, own yes, yacht, is, super yacht, is, I think. This is a nice uh, sun reef, <clears throat> 68 feet uh, in Singapore that we use in a lot of the corporate events as well as uh, charter out for uh, high net worth individuals. Um, as you, I mean, first of all, just to quick intro is uh, we, we deal with a lot of the private jets, uh, fine wine, art, um, as well as uh, yacht purchasing and chartering uh, for many of the high net worth around in Asia. Uh, mostly our customers are Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai base. I've been trying to go to my Hong Kong office for two years now. Uh, hmm. I still haven't turned up there. Um, so we work with uh, Amex, Centurions, private banks and city, um, all, all these sort of companies. And generally the customers will um, have interest in all our products. Yacht is only one part of the thing that they will buy, um, but you know they, they have all very similar demand and similar luxury tastes. So we kind of know what they want and, and we also try to sell these solutions to them. Um, I, I would say the, the yachting market in Asia is quite different to Europe and US. Um, I think Asians uh, would generally view uh, that buying a boat, buying a yacht uh, is like buying a second home, uh, buying a beachfront villa. Uh, a beachfront villa here will be 10 million pounds thereabout, but a, a yacht will only cost you uh, one or two. Um, and it, it can move as well. So, so that's how people view it. Um, and also it is definitely a toy. It is not an investment, it's an right. expense. Thank Some you. people might write it off as a, as a, a company expense or you know, just like a, buying an office and so on, but it's definitely a toy and expense. So uh, uh, sorry, uh, Louis, Rome, um, we, we probably won't have too many people uh, borrowing money from you. <laughs> uh, usually I'll say um, people pay cash here. Um, if you need to borrow money, then, then the yacht is not for you. Uh, and you, you definitely don't want to let people, you're borrowing money for a yacht because then you're not a, a real guy, right? Um, okay. So the mindset is very different. Um, yeah. People use it as, a, as an entertainment place. 
uh, and and recently for uh, working as well because right. of the whole work from home. Um, so you are actually seeing of, that as of, office office space being used as office. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so I I could be here seeing in a Zoom call um, in in my yacht taking a call like this. So you see a lot of that happening. Uh, it's basically your own private office as well, uh, and people use it for family entertainment, birthday parties. Um, there's also, you know, we are still in lockdown, sadly, in Singapore, there's nowhere to go. We're a little island, you can't sail 10 minutes out, you're in a different country. So you can't, you can't, you, we're locked here in an island. Hong Kong is pretty much the same, it's got a few more islands you can go to. Um, Thailand, Malaysia, there are places, Indonesia, certainly you've got places to go to, but at the moment, travel is still very much restricted. Uh, I would say uh, at least until 2022. It might open up round about summertime in 2022 um, to neighboring countries. So we're in a sort of a, a unique um, situation here. Um, so the, the charter market is, is very strong here. Uh, we're getting about two to three hundred percent the the volume compared to pre-COVID. Right, and we I think you were telling me that catamarans is a is a particular best type of yacht that people seem to be chartering regularly. Is that is that right? And and maybe why why that particular type of yacht? Yeah, it is true. I think it's probably the shape. Uh, I don't know what you know about feng shui in, uh, in Chinese. Very um, a little, very little. Real estate, the, the, the floor space being nice and square is very, um, uh, it's a very nice thing to have for Asians. So if I move away, you can see the, the beautiful square shaped lounge here. Yeah. Um, so you know, nice. this is the sort of design that a lot of the Asians like with a big lounge dining table uh, where they can get together, drink wine, sing karaoke. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a very different um, concept versus what Europeans do, which is to lie on the deck and sunbathe yes. yourself. Yes. Um, people do not sunbathe here. I mean, it's it, it, it's very okay. rare. All okay. right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and are there differences in approach? Obviously, you're in Singapore, and you're dealing. Well, are there differences in approach between, say, Singaporean clients and Hong Kong, or and mainland China clients? And, and what, what are you seeing there in terms of approach? Yeah, I think um, Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, they're a little bit more westernized, though they will understand the um, legal side of things, uh, the funding, uh, the paperwork, they will kind of, you know, it, it was like buying a, a property, they will understand their processes. Um, Chinese guys tend to be very impatient, as you already covered. Um, they want it yesterday and say, here's the cash, why can't I have my boat tomorrow? Yeah. And yeah. I've got a, you know, I mean, Adam and I did a deal and they were they were basically saying, hey, we've, we've got a client party on Friday night. Can we just have a boat? <laughs> you know, this right. is like in, in 48 hours time. It was, it was kind of, and they're not joking. They, they really do want it. Um, so yeah. here's the money. Why can't we just get on it? You know, it's like that. Right. Um, so um, I, what we do, we, we basically uh, manage the buying process um, to kind of give them a, a more realistic expectation um, and also push both sides. Uh, some of the clients are also not very focused because buying a boat is only a very, very small part of their life, of the business. Mm. Um, whereas for us, it's like we're spending all our time on this one deal. For them, is like I've got important property to buy. I've got a golf game. Um, I've, got to, uh, I've got to buy a jet. You know? So they are less focused. So we have to kind of focus them to push the, the process um, of, of purchasing. Yeah. And we would do that all the way up till they we hand over the keys and then they get the second and third sale. Um, then then we say, well, anything else, just let us know. And after sales requests, you, what sort of things do you see? Do you, do you, you could still assist them after the purchase, I suppose? Are, are there any unusual sort of requests that you see for things? Or... Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's generally it's like uh, specking out a country home. Um, so so we, we once they... We, we normally advise them not to do anything until they've actually sell once or twice and then kind of understand what they really want. Yeah. But uh, certainly new sofas, new furnishing, um, uh, most of them will want this latest uh, uh, music system. So, right. so speakers that go all the way around the boat everywhere. Um, and then now, of course, the giant TV, you would want a 55, 65 inch TV um, <laughs> okay. put on the yacht and so on. Right. Um, so uh, all the best Wi-Fi um, and, and so on. And the more quirky ones will be looking at uh, wine cellar. I don't know why you would want a wine cellar in the, 
on a boat, but no. probably just wine storage so that they can yeah. drink. Um, so, and, and uh, of course, all the renewing the, the furnishing and decks and all that. So sometimes we want to tell them, well, why, why, why do you spend all this money to renew? Why don't you just get a new boat? <laughs> because you're probably spending less. Yeah. Um, you know, so we kind of have to give them a bit of a, a realistic expectation. Okay. Um, and then not to uh, overspend. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe, maybe just one or two final questions. Um, I asked Adam about crypto use of cryptocurrencies. Um, is, is that something that you you are seeing is it more on the, that, that sort of impatient people want no. to buy things? Uh, are you you're not yeah. seeing it? You are or not? I mean, that, there's definitely no no crypto here. I mean, uh, right. I, I think even crypto is banned in China, so there's no way. You know, I mean, we will have to wait for the millennials to to grow up to be 50 year old before <laughs> you will see a first crypto deal. Here. Yes. Uh, but I don't see that happening. Um, in the near in the next ten years, right? Okay, okay. Uh, and, there, and 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 access to marinas and things in Singapore. How are you placed there? Obviously, in in, in Hong Kong, yeah. Adam talked about the the new one on Lantau, but are there new developments in Singapore? Um, not really. I think I think the I think the supply and demand is still decent here. Um, it's still a small place, but we do see. Um, you know, bigger boats and, and more owners. I mean, there's definitely a growth in that market, but I think the growth is more on the charter market at the moment rather than purchasing. Yeah, right. um, people are, you know, if before you buy a boat, you will want to charter a few times, first of all, to see whether you like the boat and secondly, whether your family likes the boat. You know, they, they might charter a few times and then they will say, well, actually, you know, we don't really need it, you know, so yeah. they will continue to charter. But buying is a very uh, uh, a different thing. Okay. Um, and, and so, so there's, I think it's still balanced, uh, supply and demand in terms of your space here. Okay. Hong Kong, I think it's definitely, uh, 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 there's more, um, demand because of the Chinese people, um, trying to park the boats in, in Hong yeah. Kong and so on. I see. Um, okay. and I think one thing that I want to cover with the China is that, um, we talked about, um, you know, whether there's a growth in China, we don't see that because of the whole geopolitical clampdown, the whole government. Um, if you buy a big boat and stick it right in front of the Shanghai uh, Huangpo River, I think that's kind of like an open invitation for the government to audit your company. Yeah. So, yeah. so many Chinese will, again, will use your BVI, the, the nameless structures, or, or even just have it in Europe or have it in Singapore or Thailand, uh, far, far away from the Chinese government. Right. Um, so, so I think the numbers will still be quite small in China compared to Western Asia. Okay. Well, that, that's a very interesting point to finish on, Vincent. In fact, thank you for, for, for your time also. Um, that, that then brings an end to the webinar. And thank you to Adam, Louis, Jerome, Kevin, and, and Vincent for all your contributions. And many thanks for listening. Um, we look forward to welcoming you all again at the next webinar in our series, which will likely be very early in the new year. So many thanks. And I hope the typhoon isn't too bad in Hong Kong. Um, so. So goodbye. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.